This is a Plants and Society, HRT 125. This is uh, part two, new crops to feed the world. In our search for new foods, we've uh, gone to the different continents and tried to find foods, plants that have been around for years that our ancestors used and we have not popularized. Now with the advent of the jet plane, uh, ships that travel the world, we're able to take plants from different parts of the world and utilize them throughout the world. One of the first plants that we can talk about is amaranth. Uh, this is a grain that was grown in South America. It's still used today, and if you go to Whole Foods, you find it in the, the market there. You find it as a flower, as well as a, a grain. One of the reasons that uh, it was not popularized very much is because when the Spanish came, uh, this particular seed or grain was used in the religious ceremonies of the Aztecs. And consequently, uh, it was mixed with blood. And uh, Spanish priests then forbid its use. It was almost destroyed by them uh, because of this use. Nowadays, we see it mixed in soups. Uh, it almost looks, uh, can be used like rice. Quinoa is another plant that comes from South America. Uh, this was grown along with the potato in the Andes Mountains. Uh, it had to be grown up high. The Incans took it and populated it all up and down the Andes Mountains and into South America. Its use at the time was only secondary to the potato. It was actually very uh, much used the same way. It could be freeze dried. However, unlike the potato, uh, the whole plant could be utilized. Remember, the, the leaves and the upper parts of the potato could not be used. It has very high protein uh, count, higher than the potato. Uh, it's also high in calcium and phosphorus. Uh, one of the good things about it also is that it's very easy to grow. And because it's so easy to grow, it can be grown hydroponically in soilless mixtures. This could be a possible crop to use on space travel. Tarwi, again, another plant from South America. Uh, this plant too has a large amount of protein, 40% protein and 20% fat. Again, this has been used for ancient times in stews, uh, soups, salads, when the ancient people have discovered that it worked well mixed with other proteins. Uh, it's very rich in the essential amino acid lysine. Um, it does have some bitterness to it. So each different group has learned to either boil it out, steam it out, uh, and dry it out in the sun to get rid of some of its bitter nature to it. Uh, Tamarillo, again, native to the Andes Mountains in South America. Unlike the other previous plants you saw, this was transferred to Australia and New Zealand, uh, just like the kiwi plant. This was a sweet uh, plant. Uh, it could be used frequently, uh, mixed with a little bit of sugar, and as a breakfast dish. Uh, it can be used as juice. Um, frequently in South America, it's mixed with sugar and served as on street side vans as a quick pick me up drink. However, most of it now is produced in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, Naranilla, uh, which in Spanish means a little orange, uh, again, came from um, South America. It's also known as apricot tomatoes. It, uh, again, very rich in vitamin C and A. And again, it could be just uh, eaten off the vine. Um, it does have some sweetness to, it, to itself and frequently served on uh, roadside stands. Oka, uh, 
again from the Andes in South America. This also needed to be high up on the hills to be produced. Uh, like the potato again, the entire plant could be eaten along with the leaves and the flowers. Along with the other plants, it was also brought to New Zealand and uh, South America. They thought it could be raised much easier than the potato. Uh, however, it is, takes the same requirements. The soil doesn't have to be very rich. It can be poor and rocky. And uh, you can't appreciate the size of the size of this picture, but they're the size of a, a large marble. Breadfruit um, grown on, on trees was found in the South Pacific. Uh, at the time, it was thought that since it was so easy to grow, it was very thick on the trees, uh, this could feed all the people in the Caribbean. And the, the British sent a big expedition there to bring this fruit back to uh, the Caribbean. We have seen this. Uh, this has been uh, out in a movie, actually, um, called The Mutiny and the Bounty. Uh, this ship sailed from England uh, along the south part of Australia. And you, most of us have seen that movie uh, where the, the plant's safety, which was much higher uh, than the safety of the, the seamen on the ship. It was Captain Bly who protected the plant uh, more than anything else. Uh, so consequently, uh, there was a revolt, revolt, the mutiny and the bounty that was called, where the plants were all killed. Uh, Captain Bly was set adrift, and uh, the mutineers uh, stayed out in the South Pacific. This was eventually brought back to the Caribbean, but did not prove to be fruitful in feeding the population there. We can change the plants that we already have. Uh, for example, the tomato. The tomato was uh, actually almost not utilized anymore uh, because of the costs associated with harvesting it. There's a, a picture here of a corn plant. We can make them bigger. We can make more stalks. We can make more ears of corn. We can take the tomato and make it larger. One of the problems with the tomato was, how do we pick it? Uh, how do we grow it with less water? Well, if we develop new varieties, they can do just that. It became very expensive to have the tomato because it had to be hand-picked. And because it was hand-picked, uh, it took longer. And it had to be protected because of the soft skin. We changed the genes. Genes allow us then to develop a machine that can pick tomatoes, and so now tomatoes can be seen at the supermarket, uh, still very cheap. We can change things uh, by looking at the DNA also. We can take uh, DNA from a different plant and move it into the new plant. Uh, this is done in a variety of different ways. Uh, the most common way is to take uh, a round organism, which we call a, a plasmid. We take that and we inject part of DNA into this and move it into the plant that we want. This new DNA then supplants the actual one. So now, if we've taken a wild plant and a current plant, where the wild plant is resistant to a fungus, we transfer into the current plant, now we have a plant that resisted the fungus. We can do this with all sorts of uh, different genes and protect the plant, make the plant grow stronger. One of the earliest examples was something called BT corn, which, or transgenic corn. What the scientists wanted to do was to make it more resistant to insects. We moved a new gene into this. The gene for the Bacillus thuringiensis was placed there. The, the corn then was resistant to the bugs that would come 
that as soon as they bit into the corn, they would die. However, as we looked at the side effects, it seemed to affect the monarch butterfly. Uh, the monarch butterfly uh, comes out in the springtime. Uh, we all know the story of the monarch butterfly. It's a beautiful butterfly. It travels uh, down to Mexico every year, way up high, 30,000 feet up into the sky. Very beautiful land, people loved. One of the possible side effects of the BT corn was it might harm the monarch butterfly. Consequently, uh, it wasn't used as much. Another corn that was out there was called uh, uh, starling corn. This was a type of BT corn that we we decided that one of the things we would take the transgenic corn and only give it to animals. Well, of course, uh, this didn't entirely work because this corn was then found uh, at Taco Bell uh, in the food. And this, of course, raised alarm, and then the corn was banned. Another good example of how we can change things is golden rice. In Asia, there's a large amount of vitamin A deficiency and consequently blindness. Uh, one of the things that happens in Asia is that the brand coating, the outer coating of the rice kernel is removed. Uh, this makes for a white corn, which most of the population wanted. Uh, this led to a loss of many vitamins, one of which was vitamin A. We can change the corn. We can change the corn to give us amount of vitamin A. As you can see here, it's called golden rice because of the golden color. Uh, unfortunately, the public in Asia uh, refused to use this new rice and to stop uh, the thousands of cases of blindness. Uh, in India, a new potato was uh, created. It has 35 to 60 percent more protein in it. So consequently, eating this uh, again could start could solve a lot of starvation problems in India. They are successful in India. Not much successful in the other parts of the world. A gene from the grain amaranth is put in here, which causes it to produce more protein. It also has higher levels of lysine and thionine. So again, mixed with corn, it almost makes a complete diet. Tomato plants uh, were very susceptible to salt. What happened is that we changed the plant again. Along the Chesapeake Bay, uh, the land had been used for tobacco growing for many years and it was very deficient in nutrients. However, the tomato plant could grow there very easily. The trouble was that salt water could be into it and then could ruin the uh, fruit. A new tomato plant was developed that allowed salt to be taken in by the plant but not brought it to the fruit. Uh, cassava. Uh, this is uh, again from uh, South America. It's very popular in Africa. Uh, easy to grow crop, uh, tolerates poor soil. We can change it. On the right has more beta carotene to it, higher shelf life, and a lot more vitamin A. Another type of tomato is called the flavor saver tomato. Uh, one of the things about uh, tomatoes or any fruit is how you harvest them. The fruit that is harvested all at the same time is much cheaper to produce. So if you can get a tomato plant where everything is harvesting at the same time, such as the flavor saver tomato, uh, harvesting becomes cheaper and the tomato becomes cheaper itself. Uh, unfortunately, this too was not found to have a good commercial success. Throughout the world, um, most countries allow uh, genetically modified plants, but there are some uh, 
that don't. You can see from this map uh, that most of the world will allow these. And this may uh, save some of the population explosion which we're expecting to see. Uh, there are some countries that are, are slower on the uptake. Uh, for example, France uh, does not allow as much uh, genetically modified plants. Uh, but what they're seeing is a huge increase in the cost of food. And they're actually having to import more food from other countries, uh, which is leading to a huge social problem. We have seen in the past uh, large changes in biotechnology. These next two slides show you some idea how this has changed. We started in 8000 BC with the people in Mesopotamia uh, changing their cattle, making them better. Some could have more milk production, some could have uh, bigger meat production. Uh, beer may have been one of the earliest ones where we uh, um, saw that if we left uh, flour outside, that it may get it. A fungus may not be on it, and we get gotten beer. This may actually have been there before bread making. Uh, 4,000 BC, the Chinese made yogurt and cheese. Uh, we didn't know how this happened for thousands of years after that until we started inventing the microscope. Uh, we had other scientists uh, seeing how we could pass down genes. We had other scientists telling us. Uh, that it was the bacteria and yeast that allowed us to have fermentation. We see that we you can use bacteria to produce insulin. We can use bacteria to produce uh, antibiotics. Um, you can see from this list uh, that in 1997 we closed an animal, Dolly, that we all heard of there. Uh, we've had uh, weird things, too, where we have a, a fish that changes colors depending upon pollution. So we do have the technology. It's whether or not uh, we have the will to do this.